Uh, we're going to start things off. Uh, the, a lot of people would say that the modern uh, artist movement in automata uh, was uh, you know, inspired and driven a lot by a, uh, a group in, in London called the Cabaret Mechanical Theater. And uh, we happen to have uh, Sarah Alexander, whose mother started the Cabaret Mechanical Theater, here joining us uh, through Skype. And uh, uh, to introduce her, uh, I have brought uh, Richard Garriott, who has a, a collection of a lot of the uh, automata that were in that uh, sort of initial uh, um, shop in, uh, in London. So uh, without further ado, Richard Garriott. Uh, yeah, and so first I'm hoping we can get uh, Sarah back on the projection. There we go. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Yes. Hi. Hey, thank you very Hi, much everyone. For, for joining us out here. And by the way, I know you're, you're not out here in person, but you're out here in spirit and you are very well represented. There's uh, works that have come through Cabaret Mechanical Theater uh, on display uh, throughout the halls here. So uh, you would be very pleased and proud. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, but as, as you likely, uh, as I don't know, Sarah, if you were listening in uh, uh, to when I was being introduced, but I'd like to just repeat uh, you know, my ver version of that same statement, which is uh, I, for one, um, you know, was largely unaware that there, w there was a modern uh, group of craft folk building automatons uh, until I ran into Sue and Sarah at their uh, London uh, shop in Covent Garden. And, and when I did, when I arrived there personally, it was a life-changing, truly life-changing experience. I, I now uh, fancy myself as one of the, having one of the largest uh, collections of modern uh, pieces. I have a couple of thousand pieces, uh, half split here in uh, Manhattan and the other half back in, in Austin, Texas. And Sue and Sarah and the 20 or 30 artists they've had uh, working with them down through the years uh, you know, are, are, are largely responsible for that. And, and mo most of the gentlemen here on the panel see who I now collect their work. And I found some new artists today that will be collecting their work. So uh, anyway, I think I find this to be a very exciting field. So uh, S Sarah, can you, could you uh, tell us uh, how did CMT start? How did, your, how did this idea come up? Um, well, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yes, good. Okay, well, my mum started it in Cornwall as a very tiny little craft shop, and she wasn't really thinking about automata, or she didn't know the word automata, probably, um, but she started selling unusual crafts, jumpers, ceramics, um, carvings that her artist friends had made. And one of those artist friends was our art teacher at school, Peter Markey, and um, he came in and brought some very basic moving things, not this, but um, you'll recognize the type of thing that's a simple, trying to get it there, <laughs> simple characters that um, kiss, as it were. And um, Peter's work really took off and um, Soon, Paul Spooner also came into the shop, but he was making very small carved elephants, and Sue pointed him in the direction of Peter's work and suggested that he made something that moved, and um, that was really the beginning of a big transformation. And Paul started making the Anubis, small Anubis figures, that I don't know if you can Still see. Still one of my favorite lines. But you're probably familiar with the little jackal-headed god who appeared in a lot of his early work. So one thing led to another. She couldn't bear to sell it, and um, people wanted to buy them, obviously. But she, she started collecting one of each, and that became the original Cabaret Mechanical Theatre exhibition, a very small one. Yeah, and, uh, and I know you, you've had different eras, so you say you started in Falmouth and then uh, you went to Covent Garden and uh, yeah. uh, you've had a few other things. So, what's, if, so what has sort of the life of CMT been like? <laughs> Roller coaster. <laughs> um, yeah, we've had, well, over 30 years now of lots of adventures. Um, we were in Covent Garden for 16 years and it was quite a labor of love really. Uh, but thousands and thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands of people came and still remember it. And we, we met lots of new artists when we moved to Covent Garden, like um, Keith Newstead and um, Martin Smith, 
and Simon and Venus and lots of others. Carlos Zavata came later. Um, but we, we stayed there until 2000. The rent and rates were, were way too high in the end. And we set off on an adventure which took us first to South End. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> which took us first to South End and then to um, Hollywood, <laughs> which was uh, an interesting and full of heartache experience uh, where Richard actually stepped in and, and saved a lot of our collection at that time. And since then, we've been really touring. Or we have a permanent collection at the American Visionary Arts Museum in Baltimore, anybody's near-ish there so that was the the third era i think we're moving into the fourth era now uh yeah and in fact i'll, I'll wrap up with that question here in just a minute but but uh, uh i know you've had uh uh you know 20 or 30 year artists even in residence uh, working with you now um yeah and uh do you want to do you want to name those or or uh, uh but i was also going to move on if, if not i was going to move on to ask you about Kind of spin-off uh, projects. Sorry, and events. I didn't just catch what you said. Did you say name the artists? Yeah, if you if you would like, or I'll run through them in alphabetical order very quickly. Sure. I might apologize if I miss anyone out. <laughs> okay. So we have in metal Patrick Bond and Lucy Casson, Tim Hunkin, who's got a wonderful arcade in London at the moment, Ron Fuller, who was my mum's. Um, companion at art school, Arthur Ganson, who's a US artist, um, Kasu Harada, Japanese, Andy Hazel, metal again, Fee Henschel, a lady, um, my brother, Will Jackson, has made automata and now makes robots, Pierre Mayer, who I think is there, yep. Peter Markey, Keith Newstead, Walter Rothler, Martin Smith, Matt Smith, Paul Spooner, the St. Ledgers who make tiny pieces, Carlos Lots of theirs Sabata, here. who I mentioned. So there's a few. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. I missed out some of them. So, so what about your mom? Is she still involved in the CMT project at all? She likes to know what's going on, but she retired a couple of years ago, and she's happily gone back to some old pastimes, notably watercolors and writing and a bit of dancing and playing chess as well. So <laughs> she's still having fun. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, let me ask you then, uh, what about the future? What, what's happening right now and what do you think is the next era of CMT? Okay, right now it's quite an exciting time. The Craft Council in the UK have just announced that they're doing a a touring exhibition about automata and they're reviewing um, the UK automata practice over the last 40 years. So we're helping them with that and that's, that's very exciting. From our own point of view, we're developing new touring exhibitions like the Mechanical Circus one we have in development, which we're commissioning work for, is Mechanical Fairy Tales, which will launch in 2018. Um, and we're, we're working on a follow-up to our me Cabaret Mechanical book, and that, that will be announced later in the year, which is good. And we're doing lots of educational programming through another company that we've set up. So, yeah. Well, then the last thing I want to ask you, is there any hope that we will see a, a permanent exhibition space uh, like uh, was so inspiring in the uh, Coven Garden space? Well, <laughs> since you asked, <laughs> watch this space. We're, we're working on it. Um, yeah. Early days, but yes, it is something that we, we're actually looking at again now. So that's very exciting. Um, I'd love to just quickly thank Brett um, for organizing this conference and really sorry that I can't be there in person to see you all. And well, thank you. And by the way, I, I, obviously you know how much uh, CMT has meant to me, but I, I suspect everyone here from the makers to the collectors understand the really important uh, uh, position you all have in the modern history of automaton. So I would like to say thank you, uh, first of all, for your contributions to, the, to the, this world of art. Uh, and for joining us here today. And if everyone would please join me thank in, you. in saying thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. thank you again, Sarah. And now I'm going to pass over to Cecilia to uh, introduce our panelists up front today. Thanks. Well, 
I don't know. <laughs> Can you hear me? I don't want... It's Cecilia speaking. Or can anybody hear what I'm saying? Because I'm not, I'm not sure what's happened with the content. <laughs> yeah, hey, Sarah, thank you so much. We, uh, we're going to pass it over to Cecilia, and you can uh, stay on the line and listen, but uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, mute your end if, you, if you'd like. from Cincinnati uh, in 92. Um, at the time I was making props and models and miniatures for TV commercials as still photographers. Um, we were influenced, one of our reasons we moved to, we were influenced by Southern folk art. One of many artists were doing um, whirly gigs like Spin in the Wind. And I, I've always, from a, a young age, loved anything that moved any sort of piece of art. You know, I love Calder's work and just anything that had some sort of motion to it. I've always been mechanically inclined. We, my wife and I started making whirly gigs. Uh, we got a couple in a show in Salem, Oregon, and I saw this guy whose name was Dr. Ben Thal, T-H-A-L, who was a doctor, but he made these incredible whirly wind-powered uh, carved figures. He was carving wood, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to make figures. So I made a figure to, to, to be turned into a whirly gig. It didn't work the way I wanted to, but I took the figure and, and turned it into a, like a key operated piece with a stage and sort of started with that one piece, made another piece, made another piece, and thought, wow, this is something I could do. I've always wanted just to be a full time artist and just do artwork. And so I kept making pieces and, and holding on to them. Um, in 2000, I learned about art fairs, where you set up your tent for a weekend. Some, some are indoors. Um, and so this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do, you know, so I switched from doing the props to doing artwork full time in 2000. And then since then, I've kind of expanded my um, range of mecha mechanism, working with uh, wind up pieces or um, crank operated pieces and now everything is powered by electric motors because I'm in galleries and the pieces have to sit there and operate all day so it's been great and I love it it combines some of so many different things I like to do woodworking sculpting painting antiquing but mechanisms absolutely for sure just love being an inventor you know I sometimes think I was born at the wrong time you know I would like to have been born in the during the Industrial Revolution where people were inventing things. And, but I just love the hands-on aspect of it. Thomas? Uh, same question? Yeah, yeah, if you want to okay. just introduce yourself um, and talk about how you came to it. I kind of came to this stuff as a sculptor first. I was making my living doing uh, sculpture for toy industry, and um, I started my own line of things that were kind of offbeat subject matter. And I would take all the toy money that I made and I'd fund my own projects, which is kind of still what I do. Everything I make goes back into projects and tools. But um, something happened in 1987, I believe it was. My dad was doing, a, my dad was a surgeon, so my mom was a, a, an artist. She made dolls and things like that. So both of my parents have, you know, infiltrated my interests as, as uh, you know, with all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, but my mom really liked very cute things, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know, up to the, you know, she passed away this summer, but um, up until that point, you know, she would love what I did technically, but she always wanted me to do cute things. And of course, that's not quite what, what I had in mind, but, um, but nevertheless, she taught me almost everything at an early age, you know, like all the basic things she taught me early on. And my dad had a library full of uh, medical books and things, and I was always going through those. Um, 
but right around like uh, 1987, my father uh, was doing surgery on a guy who um, uh, he wasn't supposed to survive, and he was like a 95% uh, he was supposed to pass away, you know, and, uh, but he, he survived the surgery, and afterwards he was drawing on a napkin, and my dad goes, you know, my son's always doing that, he's always drawing on stuff, and, um, and he goes, he goes uh, tell me more about your son, and my dad's like, yeah, he, you know, he builds models and he likes to draw, he goes, I want to meet your son, and so I lived in Arizona at the time, and uh, my dad was working in California, so um, I, I was invited to go and meet this guy, and he, ended, he, he was working for a place called Ride and Show Entertainment, and they did uh, theme park attractions. And I was a sculptor, I didn't know anything really, I mean, I knew how to make puppets, but I didn't know how to um, control them. And so all that was very mysterious to me, and I, so I brought along some pieces that I had, some sculptures, and to show him, and he, you know, he told me, gave me some advice, he says, number one, um, he goes, you have a lot of monsters, and he goes, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do this stuff, you should learn how to do people realistically. You should learn how to really sculpt people's faces and things. And um, you know, he was looking through everything, but the thing that caught his eye was this one puppet that I had made. It was, it was an alien <laughs> that I was working on. It was all mechanical, but I didn't know how to control it. So it was just a, you know, a limp mechanical puppet. And um, he said, well, wh you know, what were you gonna do with this? And, and I told him what I wanted it to do. And he goes, oh, and he, he grabs a, a pencil and he's drawing up the mechanics of how to make the, he was an engineer and you know, he wasn't an artist. So his drawings weren't great, but the, you know, the concepts were amazing. And he had a book uh, that he gave me, and it was, it was, on, uh, it was called uh, Industrial Robots, which was a misleading title, because it was all about animatronic figures. Mm -hmm. But the whole beginning of the book was about cam and lever type figures. And I'm, I remember looking at it, and I thought it was Chinese. I, the first time I looked at it, I just, it was, all, it was typewritten, it never went into print. And to this day, I still don't know, like the, you know, it's, I, I know he wanted people to see that book, but it never got published, so. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange thing, but anyway, that book was a pretty, I'm looking back now and I'm like, yeah, that book was pretty important, you know, to start learning this stuff. And um, eventually I stopped doing toy stuff and I began doing Automata full time. Uh, I've been doing it over 10 years now. And it, it's largely because of a, a very few select collect collectors and one of them is Richard Garriott, who's, <laughs> he found me on eBay. I don't know if Richard will remember this, but he found me on eBay and he, he bought a piece and he goes, I'm gonna put that in my dungeon. And I thought, you know, I, I you know I, I get weird email. I get I get weird emails from people, and so I'm picturing like some like guy with long hair in a like in a you know like in a rock band or something with like cardboard dungeon. And he sends I see pictures of his dungeon. I'm like, holy, you know, it looked like a real dungeon, you know. And then I found out more about who he was, and you know, uh, then it wasn't surprising. But um, yeah, it's I don't know if you ever saw Britannia Manor, but if you if you ever want to see, look online. It's still up there, right? Britannia Manor, is, he had just a collection of stuff that was incredible. But, um, you know, but so between Richard and a few other people, they were the only ones basically keeping me alive that whole time. So I'm very grateful to him and all those guys that helped out. And Brian here, Brian brought me out here. Uh, he also is a recent patron of something he's been after for a while. So um, anyway, I'm maybe talking too much. It's probably time for Doug to talk. So. All right, let's see, how did I get into it and what keeps me doing it? Yes. All right, so uh, I've always, uh, since I was young and in school, I, I studied a lot of different forms of art. Uh, I, I enjoyed all of them, and uh, I've always liked mechanical things. Um, I was really good at taking them apart. I was terrible at getting them back together again. <laughs> Just ask my parents. <laughs> Piles of parts everywhere. Um, so, but despite having studied all these different forms of art and, and trying my hand at them, um, none, of them, none of them kind of felt right. And I had just had this sense that there was something I was supposed to be doing. I mean, maybe many of you have had that feeling and you haven't found it yet, maybe you have. But I definitely had that feeling and, um, you know, just kept looking and kept trying, you know, thing after thing after thing. And I recall I was making small autonomous robots that are solar powered. They're very simple uh, robots that you can just solder together. But I, I searched on, uh, you know, an early 2000s search engine that I can't even remember anymore for autonomous robots. And it didn't turn up much. The internet seemed to be a smaller place. But it did find automata at a place called Cabaret Mechanical Theater. 
And I remember, I was like, I don't know what that is. That's, those are just words. I clicked on it, and a Paul Spooner piece called Fugu came up. Maybe you've seen it. And that was a moment for me uh, that changed a lot of things. I, I studied it. I could not figure out how it worked. It's not a terribly complicated piece, but you know, I had studied art and anthropology, so I had no background in anything. Um, but though I, I couldn't comprehend it mechanically, I just, I said to myself, I might have said out loud, I'm gonna make something like that. And I think I started the next day, or maybe that night, you know, working out in my freezing cold garage, uh, making my very first automaton. Uh, the birthing engine, which maybe you've seen uh, on my website or something. Uh, and it was just a really gratifying experience, as, as Tom said, you know, just bringing together so many different, uh, different disciplines. So all those things that I had been trying, suddenly they were all useful. And, and <laughs> it wasn't one of those things I was supposed to be doing. It was all of them toward this, you know, clever and whimsical end that... Um, other people seem to really, really enjoy. And so that's certainly something that keeps me going. And a more recent interest in uh, repairing clocks uh, has you know, opened up a new sort of way of thinking about automata and what I might do next. And so another thing that keeps me in it is you know, just the possibilities uh, in combining everything one you know, is learned early in life and more recently and, and seeing you know what what new thing can be made with with everything I've learned so far so that's kind of what keeps me going Thank you. Steve? <clears throat> my name is Steve Armstrong I'm from the little town of Winchester Kentucky I can really identify with everything that's been said so far uh, I too was fascinated with mechanical things. I took my toys apart and they stayed apart. Uh, I grew up mainly in the South, although I, my family traveled quite a bit. And I was always aware of and attracted to folk art. And I think I, perhaps like Tom Haney, come at it from a kind of a folk art standpoint. And I got started making uh, simple folk art toys and whirly gigs, things that I'd seen in books or antique shops, flea markets. And at some point, I say that I had an epiphany and thought maybe there is a fine art way to do what I do. And then I discovered people like Jean Tengele and other modern uh, kinetic artists. And, uh, and like Doug, uh, by accident, I discovered cabaret mechanical theater and makers like Paul Spooner and Keith Newstead, and uh, just a whole world opened up for me. My early pieces were, were very simple, and uh, kind of by trial and error, I learned how to make a few gears work or uh, how, how effective a cam could be or levers, different mechanical elements. And um, now I'm in awe of some of the work I've seen here and, and of course, uh, the early uh, French and Swiss and German automata is so much more complicated than what I do. My movements are pretty simple and direct. I would love to learn to uh, create uh, a more complex and compound movements, and perhaps I will. Uh, I was a Montessori preschool teacher for 20 years. In 1993, I said, I'm going to make art in some form or fashion. And I have been making my rudimentary form of automata for 20-something years now, and, and somehow eke out a meager living at it. I've been lucky enough to do it full time. Well, thank you, Al. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I just want to I just want to add one one thing, and I think it um, to just kind of uh, echo some of the things that that you guys said, but also um, 
one thing that really keeps me going with um, automata is um, the reaction I get from people who see my work. And it actually seems to make people happy. <laughs> you know, people get really happy when they come upon automata. And it can be really life-changing for, for viewers. And, um, and so I found that to be really exciting. But um, I'd like to open it up, and if, um, if we want to, if, if people have questions, maybe we could take a few questions from the audience. If you don't have questions, I have plenty, but <laughs> does anybody have any, anything they would like to ask all or one of our panel? Let's see. Um, Andrew? Um, did anybody bring um, projected images? No. 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 So we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't plan for that with, uh, with this discussion. But um, I know that, like, I think all of us have our websites linked from, um, from the uh, Automaticon website. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah. Yes. Yes, very true. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe um, we could talk a little bit about process. I, I came quasi prepared to answer that one. Um, <laughs> I, I walk around with this every day. This is, I have a, a seven, seven foot tall stack of these things filled. Um, and that's how things start out. I don't know if you can see from there. I wish we could blow it up, but it's the design process is always on paper first. On this guy, um, it's this guy here. Uh, you know, it was just, it was a bunch of random ideas. I was working with a guy who's wanting to uh, do themed environments. And uh, we've been talking about all kinds of different ideas or whatever, and he was doing a, a show, and, it, and I was working on designs for this, and so it's, it's going from this show to another show to another show. But uh, I've decided to bring it in this form because this is, this is what a prototype looks like before it's committed to metal. You know, and everything I design is in wood first, because if you're making mistakes in wood, it's not that expensive. Um, brass is ex super expensive now. And uh, I, I've designed this one particularly to be uh, non-intimidating to people that don't have a lot of machinery, you know? Expensive machinery like watchmaker lathes and things like that get very expensive. And I, I, I have a lot of that kind of equipment, but I, I designed this one specifically to show that you can build something without, um, you know, breaking the bank. Um, and a lot of these mechanisms I've used on some of my other um, some of my other machines, and I'm gonna have to do it manually because we're not plugged into power, but this guy has a levitating skull and the skull uh, turns left and right when it's, when it's in midair, and there's a table that sits here. So he's got a few different, a few different motions, um, but it's all, all these things, I prototype them and it's almost like editing music, right? You, I draw them on a linear, uh, on a line uh, with, with the timeline. A time code, right? You know, zero to 60, because my, my motor is one RPM, so you have 60 seconds. And I break it up into four pieces, and I just literally draw it in. You know, it's like a, a zero to 100%. And you've got, you know, a line in the middle. You take that, and you wrap it around in a circle, and you have a basic design for a cam. And it may be wrong, and you'll, you'll draw it out, and it might not work properly, but then you go in and, you know, and, and dig at it. And after a while, after doing this, taking it apart about 20, 30 times, <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you start to get a show, and that's how the that's how it works. I don't know. You guys should probably jump in yeah. because I, I only have my process. I'm sure they all have their own special things they do. I, I don't draw as much as this guy does. It's his amazing draw sketches, <laughs> little thumbnails, and concepts, ideas. Sometimes it's just a title, or it's a man doing this, or a woman. Usually, my pieces are a single figure doing something, interacting with something. Uh, so my concepts and my ideas are s simple, and then when I go to design the piece, lay out the piece, basically overall dimensions, 
I only draw out what I have to draw out. I don't, I'm not sitting there drawing every little thing and it's like, the, you know, the pivot points of the levers are gonna be here, the motor is gonna be there, the cam, the cam is gonna be that big maximum, you know, it's just, I just draw out what I have to do. And, but I draw it out in side view, top view, uh, front view, how, how I need it. And then I get into the three dimension, it's easier to work things out in three dimensions, but that's not true. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time drawing. I want to be making it. You know, so, and it's and it's usually, you know, it goes down that way. Pretty much all of my pieces. I save all my drawings. I work on paper, I have tons of paper, and I draw figures out, and I kind of go from the figures and figuring out dimensions and how much this arm's going to move. And it's a lot of it's a, it's really a lot of making mistakes. You know, I mean, that's oh, yeah. a, a big part of it. And, and guessing. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, can get, it can be really frustrating, but that's part of it. I think that's. That's probably why we're all involved in it. Is it? It's always, you know, it's, if you have if you have a curious brain, yeah, this is the thing to do. But yeah. if you if you want quick and dirty, if you want a quick and dirty way to make a living, uh, don't do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's challenging. I love the challenge. It's like solving a puzzle. Sometimes, oftentimes, it's it's like being an inventor. I'm going to invent this thing that's never been done before, and it's a challenge for me to. Lately, I've been trying to internalize my mechanisms and not have them outside, put them all inside the body, and um, I just love to challenge myself, and I, you know, I'm always up for that. Wait, and Doug and Steve, do you want to add to that? Uh, uh, I, it's some, somewhere between what these guys do. I, I don't draw as well as Thomas. I don't know many people that draw as well as Thomas, but um, I, I do sketches. Then I move to 2D lo-fi materials like cardboard. Then I do more sketches. Then I move to sort of inexpensive wood. Then I do sketches, and then I move to uh, you know the finished, uh, the better quality wood. So drawing is really important in my process, though uh, they're not the kind of drawings I. <laughs> what kind of what kind of keep? Uh, you know, what's your favorite wood to use on your cams and stuff for durability? Um, I I my my absolute favorite is is cherry, oh, and oh, that's nice. yep. it's a dimensionally stable. Um, and uh, it's been used historically in wooden works clocks, so it uh, makes it has a history of being used for purposes, you know, very much like the ones that, that I'm using it for. See, I don't work, I don't, I don't do a lot of my uh, finished work in wood, so I'm always intrigued by people that are woodworkers and what mm -hmm. they use. And you know, I'm, I'm much more limited to the materials. I'm sure both of these two guys, particularly, well, actually, all three of these guys use wood way more than I do, and they are more knowledgeable than me on that, so um, I've always, often wondered, so like the hardest woods are cherry, and what would be the next? Uh, the hardest, I guess, is lignum vitae, you know, it's uh, ridiculously yeah. hard. You have to machine it rather than use traditional woodworking tools and has its own oils in it that lubricate. So, but to work with it is, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Um, but, you know, other hardwoods, boxwood, and some fruit woods are very hard. Um, I mean, uh, maple's hard, I, I, I don't use it, but I love it in general. I don't know what you use, Steve. Well, I do almost everything with uh, yellow poplar. It's a wood that's readily available in Kentucky. Um, I, I do a preliminary sketch just to kind of work out the details of a mechanism. I usually have an idea it's going to be a figure or a series of figures that are doing uh, particular motions and then try to devise a mechanism that will enable that to happen. And I, like, I like it being kind of a, a malleable process where you can kind of make changes as you go. And uh, some of my best ideas come while I'm actually working. Uh, it's sometimes as simple as just thinking, I need another figure here. Uh, I like working in the wood I do, uh, before I start carving, I do basically cut out two profiles, say of a figure, on a bandsaw. So I'll, I'll start out that process by doing kind of a detailed drawing and making a template. So it's not, uh, it's not a drawing with uh, shading and stuff like that, but more of an outline. I can trace that onto the wood, cut it out on a bandsaw, and then go to work with hobby knives and rasps and uh, chisels and what have you. 
But I like it being that kind of malleable process that can change in midstream. Uh, I, I think I come at it more as a fine artist, a sculptor. Uh, maybe not a very good one, but uh, yeah. the, the movement comes secondarily, and uh, I, I would like to I would like to learn more about uh, uh, complex mechanisms, like I said earlier, and change that. But right now, the movement really is secondary to uh, this idea that I'm creating a piece of sculpture. But okay, answer the question. Yes, and um, I wanted to follow up on that then too. Uh, none of you guys mentioned um, laser cutting or CNC. And um, I'm wondering if any of you use um, 3D modeling, or if you think about that, or if you see yourself uh, in the future using laser uh, or laser cutting or 3D printing, CNC, any of any or all of the above. Is that everybody's shaking their head. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I no. you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, the, I don't use any of this stuff, but um, I, I'm aware of it, and I, and I. I'm fascinated by it. In fact, one of the toy companies that I worked for was the very first company to ever use any of that stuff. And they were scanning actors before anybody was scanning actors' heads and things like that. Um, but I, that's when I got disenchanted with toys because it, I'm, I'm used to like working with my hands and I'm not a computer programmer. If I was a computer programmer, I probably would design strictly on a computer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, it just depends on what, you're, what you are and I think my, you know, Steve said something very important. Is he says he's coming at it from a, from an art standpoint, a fine art standpoint, and uh, a lot of I think uh, even the the old automata in their day were were considered considered more entertainment, uh, like fa really fancy entertainment for wealthy wealthy-ish people to have in their homes, and they would have these things in their parlors. So they were always, uh, you know, kind of based on uh, clowns and things that were popular in the day, like miniature mechanical versions of those. Um, but I don't think, you know, you would find those things like in the Louvre uh, because they weren't considered that, you know, high art. But to me, I'd rather see those than anything in the Louvre, you know, as much as I love that museum. But, um, I, I, you know, like to me, the Haunted Mansion at <laughs> Disneyland is like Mecca mm -hmm. for what I love, you know, I mean, and it still is. I go there and I'm still, you know, like a little kid when I go on that ride. Um, so, yeah, 3D modeling and all that stuff is, is, is going to only advance, and especially with machining, when they can print metal um, quickly and accurately, it's gonna change, it'll be an unbelievable change in all the way that people design things. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think, for, for, for my own taste anyway, um, I like to have my hands on things. Mm -hmm. So designing something on a computer, I could actually do it quicker, you know, on a sketch pad. I, I've literally gone, you know, at a diner, drawn something out and been home and had it built in a prototype format where someone would still be working on the code for the for the program, you know. Uh, and the, yeah, the machine would do it quickly, but the, it's the programming part that I don't know, so mm -hmm. I, I play with the tools that I have. And I think it's, you know, that's advice that I would give anybody. It's, you know, if you're a programmer, then, you know, use the tools that are that, that you're comfortable with to express yourself, because that's what art's supposed to be, is, you know, whatever you're, you are, you're expressing with whatever tools you choose, mm -hmm. so. Uh -oh. What I can add to that is uh, I was approached one time by an artist rep that said, why don't you make the prototype? I'll, I'll get a shop of craftsmen together and we'll do an addition of 50 and you'll, instead of making X number of dollars, you'll make lots of money. <laughs> but there's something about making it, every part of it yourself and making it out of something like wood in my case and it being a one-of-a-kind thing, that's important to me. And the idea of, uh, but I, I have been fascinated by the idea that there's a 3D printer that can take a gear, maybe that you carve out of wood, and do a hundred of them effortlessly. Well, I'll say, but, I have to say this one, I'm sorry. There's, go ahead. Oh, there's one thing I was gonna say about the, the 3D printing that a lot of people don't understand is how slow those machines are unless you have very expensive machines. So to output what you've created, and you're reliant on someone, and that's another problem that I have. I don't like to rely on people, so I built my own workshop, so I can run around. I can one minute be in a mold shop or be on a lathe or on a mill, and I don't have to like you know call somebody or you know I can be at three o'clock in the morning. I want this, and I can go over and make it. 
Um, and if you don't have a very expensive 3D printer in your shop, uh, that's a problem. That would be a huge problem for me. And you know, I've seen the, the small desktop ones and one fellow showed me this, this head that he did. It was a scan of his own head, but it had all the, you know, it was, it was kind of muted and everything. And I looked at it and he says, yeah, this is, you know, and I said, well, how long did that take to print? He said, 16 hours. I go, well, I, I can sculpt a head in two hours and then you could scan that. You know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't, it, but it's, yeah. it's all about speed and that stuff's getting fast and the price will come down. And then at that point in time, it'll be a much more, you know, it'd be much more interesting to me anyway. So. Okay. Well, um, okay. So this kind of brought us into an area that um, I think is, is important to a lot of people. And that's, um, that's how do you balance um, your artistic vision versus your, your need to, to stay alive, you know? How, how, do we, how do we earn a living doing something that we love and that in order to do it the way that we want to do it, you know, takes a tremendous amount of time and effort. Um, so how, you know, we just have a few minutes left. So if you can, I know it's like a topic we could go on for, you know, another couple of weeks on, but if you can keep your answers relatively brief and kind of how you wrestle with that yourself. Anybody want to start? <laughs> See, not, notice nobody wants to start on that subject. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, a dif that's a difficult one. I mean, you can't mm, put so much time into one piece. And uh, as the price goes up, I think it's it's like a pyramid. More and more, less and less you know, <coughs> limited people out there who are going to be able to afford it or who will afford it. Um, I've since I was doing the art fairs, I we were doing big pieces that were in the three to four thousand dollar range, and I'm like, I need some lower price. I need some, you know. And I think I had some things that were seven fifty, and that's not cheap, and that's not affordable for everyone. But it's what I would do pieces that are in a range of things because yeah, you have to. What you're doing is you want to do. F it full time and you have to make a living at it and you have to sell it has to be you know somebody asked me today it's like wouldn't you when you make pieces of your you know do you love them so much that you don't want to sell them it's like yes that's true i have some pieces that i don't i haven't sold but this is what i do this is the only way i can do it full time is by selling them so yeah but it's it's a challenge and you have to figure out that balance whatever works for you um, I've never found the balance, honestly. I, I'm still trying, but well, I think yeah. I think the, the the trick is, I mean, for me is, uh, I you know I kind of accidentally started doing this. I didn't think I'd be doing this as a full time job, um, and I'm right now I'm shifting from doing only parlor pieces that go into private collections and never get seen to trying to do a little bit of that plus uh, doing themed environments, and I for that I need other people. I can't obviously do that alone. So I've been working on that for about a year and a half. Uh, with almost no pay because we're just develop we're trying to develop it. Um, so uh, that's you know to me what I've noticed is I had um, you know a few people came by my shop and used to be able to see the stuff in the studio, but I never showed it anywhere else. And there were some videos, but unless you knew how to find the videos, you couldn't see it. Um, and that became that started to become frustrating to me because these things are they might be for me when I make them, but when they're done, they're for other people. You know, they're not. It's it's not. You know, once I'm done, it's like it, it's it's there for other people to play with. Um, and I thought, you know, it'd be a good idea to finally take them out. Once I started taking them out and showing them people, it became obvious that, you know, this this idea would work and it would be a worth worthwhile thing to do. Um, but, you know, it's it is a struggle to to try to balance those things. Some of these things, like this little guy, <clears throat> there's probably about seven thousand dollars of R and D into this little guy, and he's been sitting here. I think Richard remembers this. I was working on this age, how long ago? It was like a decade ago or something, ages ago. And I never finished him because I, I ran into some, some issues that at the time were, you know, I'm like, well, I'll get back to it. And I never, I've just been so busy, I haven't gotten back to it. But that's the nature of this work is you'll put in so much time uh, on many different projects. And, um, it, you know, if, you're, if you were to like put a dollar amount on it, it gets crazy. Uh, in, you know, and some people see the price of the, some of these pieces and they're like, wow, that's really expensive. Some of them are mid-sized car prices, right? Uh, but when you see the hours that go into it and the tools that you gotta have to do it and all the, like, you know, th I brought this guy to contrast with this one because this one you do, would require, you know, watchmaking, horological tools to make something like that. Uh, not so with this, but 
that's the difference between you know prices, and most people don't care. You know, <clears throat> Steve said something interesting. He said, you know, he said that his his things are direct and simple, but I, I think people respond better to that. Honestly, a lot of people, some of the most complex things that I've made, you know, they'll look at it and they'll go, yeah, that's that's interesting, but then they'll see something. I have a little push pull thing that I made, and people, you know, they, that really strikes them, and it's just you know, it's just a simple push pull thing. So it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, you don't have to have a a super expensive workshop or anything to touch people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, did you guys want to comment? Otherwise, we I'll, take I'll comment very briefly. So I don't make my full-time living from it. I, I sort of wish I could. I haven't figured it out at all. So what I did was try to find an occupation that was complimentary. So I repair clocks uh, as a way to pay the bills. And uh, it, while I'm not making automata all the time, I am learning skills and acquiring tools and learning about methods and techniques that can feed back into it. So it's, it's something of a compromise where here's something that pays the bills, but it also elevates what I can do in terms of the automata when I can make the time to do it. Uh, my wife and I are both artists and uh, it seems that uh, if I have a, a period where I'm not selling, she'll sell something. And then the reverse is true. And uh, somehow we stay afloat, but we make a lot of sacrifices. We drive beat up cars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we stay home a lot. And we don't eat out much. And when we're not selling, we have uh, beans and frankfurters. And, Ooh, you guys are lucky. Beans and frankfurters. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, when we sell a piece or two, then we get to come to Autom uh, Automa, Automacon. Wherever we are. Say it for me. Automaticon. There we go. I, I'd like to say, well, since this, is, this discussion is about art-related things, um, not so much the techno-mechanical part, but um, uh, there was a documentary I had, and it's, it, was, it was Man Ray, and I thought he said something pretty brilliant even though it was simple, he said uh, people are always would come up to him and say, "How do I do? How do I become original?" And he says, you "Just says, be yourself, and you're you're original." You know, and I, that's one advice I would say to anybody that's going to make anything creative is that uh, you'll be most appreciated if it's from the heart. You got to have something that's you know really of interest to you and uh, personal to you. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, if I could add one point to okay. that, I get asked a lot, "Where do you get your ideas?" And I think absolutely every book you've ever read, every place you've ever traveled, every person you've ever met, every interest you've ever had, they, if you let those come into play in your work, then you will be full of ideas and you will be original. Okay. I did see a hand over here. Yeah. I recently did a um, I recently did a museum show and we had a piece in there that had to run it was on a, it was on a uh, uh, it, it was on a motion control sensor so when people would walk by this thing would run um, and, and I, I actually I prototyped it in wood just like this thing but this you know we're talking big giant cams in, inside this machine because it was about a six and a half foot wide machine and I, I never got the chance to do uh, aluminum cams but if, if you're going to do something industrial I would suggest you know, um, all that stuff not only has to be, you know, done in metal, but you have to do redundancy testing on it. If you're, I mean, if you if you talk to people that work at Disneyland or whatnot, they have a, a whole crew that's on these machines all the time, maintaining them, and that's how that's you know th those are million dollar machines, by the way. Some of those animatronic figures are million dollars plus. I mean, some are four million dollars, so they're quite expensive. Um, and on top of that, there's maintenance. So the way they make it up is by volume people coming through the door. Uh, you can't do that when you're, you know, on this level. You know, so you well. You let me let me add to that though, yep. because um, I do a lot of pieces for public um, installation, and they go into, you know, they're like in in clinics and stuff where um, there is unfettered access to them, and they are run by cranks. And so what, what I've found is that I, I do most of my work with, with wood, um, but
but the initial point of contact <laughs> is gonna be steel. Um, so I make the initial axle um, steel so they can't bend the shaft mm -hmm. at all. And another little trick I do is that I, I make that the handles, you know, if you give them a really good handle, they'll grab it and they can torque it and, um, you know, cause problems. So what I do is uh, I make the handles as little as possible so they have to <laughs> do a good idea. finger <laughs> fingertip and then they can only like turn like that. Can't really there, like there, just there was, and so um, and then you know it's I do uh, from time to time have breakage but it's I look at, at it as um, investigation like you know I, I don't have the time to do the trial in my I, studio so it, it happens on yeah. the floor. I, I have one I have one funny story if I have a second. To step in for a second ask ask us to Wrap up. We've okay. got a, another big panel coming in. We need okay. to switch over for it. Excuse yeah. me. So, but thank you all for. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.